Hello, my name is Marta Garcia and I'm the Chief Product Officer at Kids and Us. Hello, my name is Hector Ruiz and I'm, I'm a researcher in cognitive psychology of learning. Kids and Us has 20 years experience in the field of education. In 2003, our founder, Natalia Perarnau, created a methodology which today is taught in 10 countries and reaches 180,000 students. This methodology consists of reproducing the natural process of mother tongue acquisition. So we make the most of the natural abilities that our children have during these first years of life. So um, when learning a language, we always use a metaphor and say that when a child is born, he or she is prepared for language learning as a bird is to fly. Verbal language is an essential property of humankind and you can see that in the fact that uh, our brain uh, has a natural predisposition to learn the mother tongue since we are born, in, in fact. When we are still in the womb, we are already learning uh, the mother tongue. Uh, this predisposition allows us to, to learn in a, the language in a way that seems magic because uh, you can learn it without realizing that you are doing that effort and these mechanisms that we have to, to learn, the nice, the, the beautiful thing is that you can use them not only for learning one language, you can, you can learn more than one uh, at the same time. And this is not going to be a problem. Uh, in fact, it's going to, to provide you. And this is one of the most uh, beautiful gifts that your parents can offer you, which is the, the gift of learning more than one language. Very often families are concerned of whether learning more than one language at, a, at such a young age is going to interfere negatively uh, when learning their mother tongue. Yeah, these concerns are quite common to think that you need to consolidate your mother tongue before learning a, another language. But uh, actually uh, research has shown us that uh, in fact you don't need to wait to learn your mother tongue uh, in order to learn another one. Uh, in fact, if you use this predisposition that the brain has uh, to learn uh, the language, uh, you can learn more than one uh, language, uh, several languages uh, at the same time, and this is not going to be a problem. Maybe you see some uh, episodes where uh, the, the kid uh, mixes the the language or shows preference for one of, of them, but at the end of the day, the, the result is going to be positive. They are going to learn the languages in a, in a native way, uh, which is uh, wonderful. When speaking about reproducing the natural process of mother tongue acquisition, the first thing that happens at Kids and Us is that children listen to English. They are exposed to, to the language daily, because at home they listen to an, o an audio track which contains the story that is going to be told in the class afterwards. They're going to listen to songs, structures, short dialogues. And um, the job of the teacher when they are in, in the class is to contextualize all that input. So what happens is that children connect what they have been listening to at home with the meaning hidden behind. So that magic happens and they start to understand and we reach the second phase of the natural process, which is comprehension, understanding what is going on, because actually they are using those uh, sentences, those structures that they have listened to and understood. That means that speaking happens quite simultaneously. So we provide our students with many opportunities to verbalize everything they're hearing at home and, and, and understanding. And at the end of the day, this is what a language is for, right? For communicating and, and we want them and we encourage them from day one to, to use English in the class only. Yeah, we, we, we learn by giving meaning to our experiences. And uh, this is because uh, learning uh, is about making connections between the information that you are uh, experiencing and your prior knowledge. And the best way to uh, be sure that 
uh, another person is, give, is giving meaning to their experiences is by uh, helping them apply what they have learned, to apply this learning, this uh, information. So uh, when you are learning a language, speaking uh, is the best way to apply that, that uh, learning. So it's very important to realize that learning is not just about receiving. Uh, receiving information is not just receptive process, it's a generative process. And you really learn something when you use uh, this information that uh, is in your mind, that is in, in, in your brain, and you use it to give meaning to your experiences. Actually, that's why we say that our students are actors not spectators. The last two phases of this natural process of language acquisition are reading and writing. At Kitsanas we introduce these skills at the age of eight because we want our students to have consolidated the most important um, oral skills, right? So we understand that reading and writing should happen after having listened to the language after having understood the meaning of it and having spoken. Uh, so sometimes this causes a bit of surprise, okay, because we do that later than what is normally done, but uh, we do it with a very clear purpose. Yeah, writing is a technology that uh, humankind created in order to represent uh, oral language. So you first need to understand oral language in order to be able to write. Uh, of course, if you, if you learn a second language when you are old, uh, uh, writing and reading is going to help you because you already know how to read and how to write in your own uh, language. But when you are using this natural predisposition of the brain in order to learn a language like you do in Kids and Us, uh, this is especially about learning how to speak uh, how to understand the oral language, because that's what the brain is, is ready uh, to do. You don't need to, to um, rush uh, in order to learn uh, to write and, and, and to read in English, while, of course, you are, you are uh, learning how to do it in, in your mother language, but because uh, you can then transfer this, this knowledge about reading and writing to English, uh, and you do it when it's the best way to do it, in when you are ready, uh, when you are able to speak uh, in, in English. So uh, writing and reading is going to be the next step. Sometimes families ask when it is the best moment to start learning English, in this case, a second language. What do you think? Well, uh, actually, the sooner the better, because uh, our brain uh, is eager to learn the language of those who surround us, uh, since we are in the, in the mother's womb. So uh, the, the brain, the system that the brain has in order to, to learn the mother tongue uh, is ready from the beginning of, of life. Uh, we are going to learn, first of all, the phonetics of the language. Uh, we are going to learn vocabulary and grammar without realizing about that. So if you want to take advantage of this natural ability of the brain to learn the mother tongue, the earlier the better. Science defines there is a sensitive period for language acquisition that goes from the moment we are born until more or less the age of seven, eight. And this is precisely one of the reasons why at Kids and Us we enroll new students until they are seven years old, because uh, we have also seen throughout these years of experience that uh, those students who lack some kind of linguistic background and uh, start at Kids and Us after the age of, of seven sometimes struggle with uh, a level of English which is sometimes a bit more complex than what you can uh, usually find, which of course exposes them to real and natural English. The sensitive period is the manifestation of the fact that our brain is using specific uh, structures and a specific type of neuroplasticity in order to learn specifically the, the mother tongue. Uh, after this period, you are not going to be able to use uh, that advantage uh, anymore. You are going to be able to learn another language, but it's going to be more effortful. In fact, your brain is going to use 
uh, regions that were not uh, aimed to, to learn a, a language. So uh, this means that uh, you will need help in order to, to learn the language. You, you will have to be taught uh, in an explicit way. But when you are in the sensitive period, you are going to uh, experience that learning is like spontaneous, it's, it's natural. You, you don't need uh, to make an, an, an visible effort. And so uh, it's, it's very interesting uh, to use, to, to apply uh, this idea of, of taking advantage of the sensitive period in order to, to learn uh, English or other languages. Uh, in a way that uh, is going to make you like natural native. Our courses have a character, a protagonist, who is the same age as the students. So all the stories that revolve around that character are very similar to those experiences our children, our students are going through in their real lives. So actually what happens is that we provide a meaningful context in which students identify themselves with the character and relate to them through the language. We learn by giving uh, meaning to our experiences. Uh, why? Because to in order to learn we connect our prior knowledge with the information that we are receiving. In order to make these connections you need to find uh, relationships of meaning. Okay, And, and this means that the, it is easier for you to learn when the experiences are relevant uh, sp uh, specifically to, to your prior experience. And this is not only important uh, in a cognitive level, also at an emotional level, at a motivational level. Because when, when what you are experiencing, uh, you find it uh, important for you because it's related to your uh, goals, uh, to you, your needs, then you put more effort in trying to, to give meaning. Actually, uh, giving meaning implies thinking. And thinking is something that uh, requires to do an effort. So if you are motivated in order to do it, uh, it's more probable that you, you will do it. So uh, it's very interesting to use this uh, meaningful uh, experiences in order to make children think about what is happening in order to make them find these uh, connections with their prior knowledge in order to learn. <laughs> Telling stories and at Kids and Us is a core resource. How do stories help us learn and, and retain information? Stories have a privileged place in our mind. We don't know why, but it's a fact that uh, we uh, remember stories better than other kinds of, of, of information, that we are really motivated to uh, hear, to follow a story. You can see that in the fact that we have a big industry around stories or around storytelling, cinema, literature. And the fact is that uh, when you organize the learning activities around the narrative of stories, you are providing a perfect uh, context uh, for students to, to learn. They are going to be motivated about knowing uh, what happens in that story. Uh, motivation probably comes from the fact that our brain is all the time trying to give meaning to the situations, to solve problems and in a story usually there's a, a conflict that has to be solved and you are going to learn much better uh, what the story uh, offered you from vocabulary to sentences to facts. At Kids and Us we sing a lot and we dance. Uh, music is a very important instrument. How does or why is uh, music or, or singing or using melodies so powerful when learning a language? Well, like stories, songs uh, have also a very special place in our mind. In this case, the fact is that songs allow us to remember literally uh, specific structures, sentences, words. 
And I say this because uh, our memory, in fact, is not very good at memorizing, at uh, rote learning. Uh, in fact, most of our memories are based on the meaning. We remember uh, the, the meaning of our experiences, but not the specific details. If we want to uh, recall them, we have to uh, reconstruct them uh, uh, with details that maybe are not uh, the correct ones. We, in fact, we are creating our, our memories every time we, we recall them. But with songs, uh, we have this ability to remember literally the specific words. You don't remember the specific words of a conversation you had yesterday with someone. You remember the meaning, but not the specific words. With songs, you have this possibility, and this is, this is going to be very helpful in, in learning a new language, because these structures, uh, these uh, grammatical structures, for example, uh, are going to help you uh, learn the, the language in a, in a way that uh, in that moment the song is, is helping you remember, but in the future you, you won't need the, the song uh, anymore. Learning is sometimes associated with the idea of effort and people sometimes expect the learning experience to be dull and boring and when they find that children have fun and when we play and sing and dance, they doubt whether that is serious teaching. And, and sometimes families pose the question of whether their children are learning English at Kids and Us seriously or whether they're just having a nice time. And of course, um, playing is a very important activity for them to learn, to, to make, in order to make learning happen children or students need to have fun or I would even say adults okay so um, we are not playing just for the fun of it but there's always a very clear pedagogical objective behind uh, playing a game. Mm. Games actually are helpful uh, with any kind of, of learning but uh, if we are speaking about uh, the natural learning uh, of, of, of the language uh, they are going to be especially helpful. Why? In science, we make a distinction between what we call uh, biologically primary knowledge and biologically secondary knowledge. Uh, the former is the knowledge that, uh, as, uh, that humankind has needed uh, from the dawn of time. And this includes the learning of uh, our mother tongue. This kind of knowledge is acquired mm, spontaneously. Uh, you don't realize that you are doing an effort in order to, to, to learn, but you are already, you are practicing. So games and songs are going to be very helpful in this kind of, of learning. So uh, in this case, uh, if you are using uh, this uh, natural ability of the brain to learn the language, using songs and, and games is a very good idea. Biologically secondary knowledge, uh, on the other hand, uh, is uh, that knowledge that we associate with what we learn in school, math, uh, science, and it requires effort. Our brain has not evolved in order to, to learn all these things in a spontaneous way. It's normal to, it's common to uh, make a uh, confusion between learning through games and trying to learn this uh, other kind of knowledge which uh, games can help in order to learn, but uh, it's, not going to, it's not going to be enough. You, you will have to, to put some effort and, and some uh, deliberate practice. Sometimes people tend to relate teaching, il teaching English to children with teaching words, vocabulary. And we're very proud if children learn how to count from 1 to 100 or they know all the colors in English. But actually, this is not the most important thing for us at Kids and Us. This is not our priority. We focus on teaching structures. So the important thing is that our students consolidate the structures, the sentences of the language so that they can communicate, they can express what they, what they think, what they want the others to know. And actually this is teaching grammar, because when you're teaching a structure, you're teaching a subject, a verb, a complement, and this is grammar at the end of the day. And we do this since 
day one, since our children are one year old, when we teach this is a yellow bird, we are teaching a structure, we are teaching grammar. Yeah, when we learn our mother tongue, uh, we do it through exposition, through social interaction, and we are not just learning vocabulary, we are learning grammar. We don't realize, but uh, we are uh, learning what are the rules of our language, and spontaneously we know, I don't know, a sentence like, uh, yesterday I go to London, is not correct, and you just realize it, uh, even if you have not been uh, uh, explicitly taught uh, the, the grammar. Grammar uh, is important afterwards in order to realize about uh, this structure, this implicit structure of, of the language. Learning grammar explicitly uh, is important later in order to, to be sure that you learn a more normative uh, language and in order to, to face uh, more complex linguistic uh, situations. I, I was going to say another thing. Um, it's understandable that uh, some people uh, find uh, like strange that you are not teaching grammar from the beginning. And probably this is because they learned the language when they were older. And where you are older and you cannot use the, the sensitive period of the brain, then learning grammar from the beginning it's okay, it's, it's, a, it's a good way in order to learn a, a, a new language. But this is not what you do in, in Kids and Us. In Kids and Us you are using this natural uh, ability of the brain to learn the language and when you use that you don't need to teach grammar explicitly. Exactly, so in the first years, in the first courses, children at Kids and Us learn the grammar of the language uh, unconsciously. Let's say they are exposed to these structures and of course they understand how the language works, okay, but uh, they don't know or we don't use these abstract terms. But we do that afterwards when, when they are prepared to cope with these linguistic terms and of course we teach grammar explicitly in, let's say, in upper stages of our methodology. And it is funny because the other day we were speaking to our student of ours and, and she was saying, I know when something is correct in English because it sounds natural to me. Kids and us refers to, of course, the kids and this us is uh, the technical professionals, kids and us, and the emotional professionals. And those are our families. Sometimes they ask whether they need to uh, be very proficient in English in order to help their children at home or support them when, when they are learning English at Kids and Us. And of course we say don't worry, this is our duty, this is our responsibility, you don't have to teach English to your children. This is what we do. But of course your role is fundamental is very important and that role consists of showing enthusiasm, being very positive and convinced about the fact that their children are uh, learning English. So we want them to show interest and, and motivation so that their, their children share that positive, positive attitude. One of the most important uh, theories about motivation, self-determination theory, uh, says that people, children, uh, are motivated uh, to learn something when they believe that they can learn it, this means when they feel competent, but also when they feel that <coughs> learning that is going to uh, be recognized by, by the group. Uh, it enhances the, the feeling of belonging. So the role of the families is uh, very important, not only for giving support uh, when the children have difficulties, which is very important too, but uh, especially in uh, showing interest every day in what they are learning, celebrating the learning, make them uh, know how important it is to fulfill commitments with, with the community. Uh, so when the family shows that uh, what they are learning, when they, their kids uh, are learning, they have to, uh, they, they, they create this um, atmosphere, th this environment 
uh, where the kid is realizing that is learning the learning that uh, that he or she is doing is is not just something for him or for her is is for the families for everyone sometimes at kids and us new teachers are surprised to see how and how much their students speak in english in in class it is not very common to see that a teenager for example uses the language confidently and and communicates fluently without those uh, feelings that sometimes people have when learning a new language of feeling self-conscious not secure of what to say and and well this is not this this doesn't happen at kids and us because children are absolutely used to using the language in in the school since the day they started the, the main driving force of self-efficacy is uh, experiencing success. Okay, you need to, to experience success and in order to experience success you have to try. But you are not going to try if you think that you are, are going to fail. So uh, for in, in order to make self-efficacy uh, grow, you need an environment that is going to uh, make you uh, feel safe. Uh, so. Uh, is an environment that is not going to make you feel ashamed because you make you made a mistake. Uh, so it's very important for students to, to to think that they can talk, they can make mistakes. Doesn't matter because that is going is what is going to help uh, them uh, learn. Our why at Kids and Us is that children have access to meaningful education. So from that idea we have always used the best resources available to provide a unique learning experience of the highest quality. And we have used, well, games, stories, songs, all these strategies that help our children learn in a natural and effective way. But of course, the world changes and, and so do our students and their needs and, and expectations vary. So um, our method is constantly undergoing a process of evaluation and improvement. And from that perspective, we are using everything innovation provides us with in order to make the learning experience better. And of course, technology provides us with loads of valuable resources. However, nowadays there are lots of questions or concerns about the use of technology in, in the education field. And from our point of view, the question is not whether technology is a good or a bad thing to use. The relevant question is how you use it. Yes, uh, lately there are a lot of misunderstandings about the role of uh, ICT in education. We have research from the 70s uh, uh, telling us that technology has a very uh, great potential for education, but lately they, there is a, a movement about the presumed effects of, of technology on, on health that are based on, on misunderstandings. Uh, for example, they are saying that screens produce myopia when in fact what can increase myopia is the fact that you uh, spend a lot of hours, uh, many hours, uh, watching something that is close, uh, close to you. So reading a book also, <laughs> unfortunately, also uh, increases myopia. Or they are saying that the screens also produce sleep disorders when what we know is that uh, you can have a sleep disorder if you use the screen before going to bed, especially if you are uh, checking uh, social networks or you are using a, a video game or something, something like this. It's not about the time you're spent uh, on the screen during the day. Uh, there are a lot of misunderstandings and I think the, 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 the worst misunderstanding is thinking that in education we are using technology for doing the same that we were doing without technology. And the point is that if we use technology is in order to get the most of it because technology allows you to do things that you won't be able to do uh, without, without it. Uh, for example, technology provides a lot of multimedia resources. Technology provides feedback, provides interactivity. 
uh, technology provides data for teachers in order to, to make better decisions, uh, what to do next uh, in order to help each student. Uh, so technology allows personalization of, of teaching and, and learning. So if we just think, oh no, uh, children don't, don't need to be in front of a, of a screen, it depends on the content, on the, on the use that, that you are doing. Uh, the use that you do in a school, in, in Kids and Us, is a, is a, is a benefit. Uh, you, you are um, making the, the most from, from, from technology. So it's a pity that all these misunderstandings are not uh, allowing us to, to, to or are avoiding uh, the use of, of technology when, when it's so uh, useful for education. Our innovation strategy at Kids and Us consists of combining the best of both worlds, because actually we're living in a physical and a digital world. So we want to reflect that on our learning experience and uh, we are not going to forget what the face-to-face -face experience provides us with, because of course when learning a language it is essential to use it, to communicate uh, in, in a natural way. But of course technology provides us with some other things which you are don't have or you're not able to, to, to use in, in a face-to-face -face classroom. One of those are, of course, data. Being able to gather data, objective data of uh, the learning performance is essential to provide our students with a, an adapted learning path, a personalized learning path. And, of course, to have the information on the right time in order to help them improve, in order to make adjustments if, if necessary during the, the learning path. So um, personalization is, well, uh, nowadays the most important trend in education probably. And if we do not use technology, we're going to, to, to be uh, out of of this new trend. Yeah. In this sense, uh, formative assessment is a methodology uh, that has a lot of potential according to research. Formative assessment is, is uh, what you just explained, is the ability to, to get data from, from students uh, all the time in order to make better decisions on what to do next in, in their learning process and technology uh, can help you uh, in order to get uh, this information in a way that without technology it's going to be very difficult or impossible. At the end of the day, uh, schools, kids and us are uh, also responsible for helping our students develop their digital competence. Uh, they are going to be asked to use technology in their academic, in uh, life, in, in their jobs in the future. So we do not have to see technology as an enemy but as a tool that we should incorporate naturally and we can help them doing that. Yes and uh, schools and schools like Kids and Us uh, I think that they are the best allies for families in order to help child children develop uh, their digital competence. I think it has no sense to ask schools not to use ICT. Uh, schools are going to use ICT in the best way possible in order to to achieve uh, learning in a controlled en environment uh, and, and they are going to, to teach students how to use uh, technology in a, in a way that is going to be uh, useful, that is going to be responsible. Families should be concerned about the use that, te uh, that, that kids made of technology out of school, not in the school. Thank you very much, Hector. It's been a pleasure talking to you. The pleasure was all mine, Marta.